So I'm really glad to be here for the 50th anniversary of the Duke Lemieux Center. I really want to thank Anne and Greg for inviting me and the whole staff, staff for organizing everything. So today I will talk about uh, a research that I made during my previous postdoc and that I'm continuing to do now. And this is uh, making collaboration with Louis Peck and Emmanuel Pudeba and all the staff of the Duke Lemieux Center David Brewer, Erin Amke, Erin Cho, Kay Wessler, David Erin, and Chris Ward. So this is about the evolution of grasping behavior and falling morphology in structurines. So grasping is a key behavior. As you can see on this slide, it is a behavior that is widespread among tetrapods. So frogs, lizards, and a bunch of mammals can grasp. And this behavior is used in a different kind of activity, such as locomotion, or feeding behavior, mating, and so on. So this is why this is a fitness-relevant behavior. There is several studies concerning grasping behaviors. And concerning the origin, there is main, a lot of hypotheses that are not mutually exclusive. And here, I will present just a selection of hypotheses in these studies that we will follow during all the presentation. So, grasping behavior may derive from arboreal locomotion, because if you don't want to fall for, from a tree, for example, you really need to grasp the substrate. And for that, usually, you are using your hand and your foot. Then, the second hypothesis is that grasping ability may derive from capture of mobile prey. If you want to catch something that is moving at the front of you, and you want to rapidly catch it, and cover the distance, you need to have something such as a prehensile tongue for the chameleons or your forelimb for primates to catch it. And then you can cover quickly the distance, grasp the animal that is moving and eat it. And the third hypothesis that I will present today concerning the origin of grasping ability is the infant carrying hypothesis. So there is uh, some studies that say that um, the animals that are carrying uh, their baby in their fur tend to use more, much more their hands when they are doing a different kind of task. So infant carrying in the fur of the mother can precede better ability of grasping behavior. So the main goal of this presentation is to quantify the relationship between prehensile behavior, locomotion, and the shape of the long bone of the forelimb in order to understand the origin of prehensile behavior. So if we are able to find any kind of relationship between grasping behavior and the shape of the long bone of the forelimb, what is nice is that we can do better inference in the fossil record and we can better understand the origin and the evolution of this behavior. What uh, we were doing for this study is that we were studying uh, living strepsirines as model group. They are really great because they display a great diversity of species and behavior, so really interesting to studies. And we were doing that mainly at the Duke Lemieux Center, which is a great research facility to do that. We, at the time when I was working there, more than 20 species, and some specimens uh, were also filmed in the zoo in Antwerpen in Belgium. So here, I just want to remember that a lot of animals are really difficult to see in the world. So it's really important to have research facility or zoo to be able to make comparative analysis like that, because in only one year in half or two years, being able to record so much data on more than 20 species, it's nearly impossible if you are going in the world. So for the first part, I will present the result for uh, the behavioral data that were uh, mainly analysis by Louise Peck, which is the first girl that you can see here, and uh, under the supervision of myself and Emmanuel Puydeba. So what we were doing here is that uh, we were uh, doing a quantification of prehension of static food items for uh, more than 90 individuals belonging to uh, more than 30 species. And to do so, we defined five grip types. The first one is uh, when the animal grasps the food with the mouth. The second one is when the animal grasps the food with one hand. The third one with two hands. The fourth one with one hand and the mouth. And the fifth one with two hands and the mouth. So, oh, it is looking. You can start the first video uh, of Odette, please. Thanks. 
here are the raw videos that we were looking at uh, yeah, from the beginning. So here, uh, Odette from the Duke Lemur Center is eating. Uh, that was a really good eater. You were able to see that she was able to take uh, the food with one hand and the mouse. And uh, we were filming them for one week, doing that for a bunch of species and looking at how they are grasping the different kind of item. You can start the second video of Bonito, please. I was doing the same kind of thing at the zoo in Antwerp. So here is a slender loris. I'm not sure that you can see it very well. These guys are pretty picky. So here it's grasping one item with one hand. No, don't like it. Taking then another one with one hand, eating it this time. So that was mainly really long analysis of how they grab the different kind of items. And what we were also doing is that in the literature it is said that the food properties such as the size of the item or the consistency may have an influence on the way that the animal are grasping the food. So we were looking at the size by defining big items such as uh, the items that are bigger than the palm of the hand and small items that are smaller than the palm of the hand. Concerning the consistencies, we were uh, defining hard and soft items, so hard uh, such as apple, nuts, and soft such as banana, for example. Let's move on to the first results. And we were testing the locomotion hypothesis, and uh, we just made a kind of gradient of uh, locomotion, so more generalist or terrestrial species such as the ringtail, and then more arboreal ones such as uh, slender loris, for example. And what we were able to see is that for quite all the specimens, when they grasp big and hard items, they tend to use, to use much more their hand. But this use of the hand is increased in more arboreal species. Concerning the small items, quite all the specimens really rather prefer to use their mouse. So here were the result. Let's move on to the second hypothesis which is testing the pre-capture if it can give better ability to grasp and to manipulate. So what we were doing is that David Brewer designed a pendulum on which, which is mainly an uh, iron stick where there is a food item that the animal really like. And you make it wave at the front of the animal when the animal is too arboreal and spend its time in the the different kind of branches, such as the nocturnal one. And we just put the pendulum inside the enclosure for the one uh, that had a better enclosure and where that was easy. And that was wearing automatically after giving uh, a hit on it. So you can start the first video that is at the top corner left, please. Here is Morticia the AI. She is really fast, so she gets it with one hand. You can start the second one, uh, yeah, please. Here is a uh, Rulio, which is uh, <laughs> not as good. The coordination between what he's able to see and what he's doing. Uh, nope. Yeah, get it. This video really doesn't deserve it. It was really good for the first try. So you can start the, yeah, thank you. Here are the technique of uh, one of the Shifakas. Jumping. <laughs> and finally, one of my favorite ones. <laughs> the ringtail technique, <laughs> which is mainly taking the stick and uh, eating it, uh, such as uh, the olive in the martini. So, what were we able to see from these videos? For all the species that induce a grasping with the end, so one hand or two hands, there was some exception that was with the ring tail where they were using directly their mouse. And what we were also able to see is that there is a laterality in uh, each individual. Here are the results for the test of the infant carrying hypothesis. So what is nice in strepsirhynth is that they have different ways to carry their baby. Some of them carry their baby with the mouse and other ones carry uh, the baby on their fur. 
And here we wanted to test for a possible evolutionary link between infant carrying behavior and, and dexterity. So we wanted to see if uh, the species that tend to uh, carry their baby on their fur tend to use much more their hand where they are eating. Here is just a phylogeny where you can see the different kind of uh, behavior. So a bunch of species are uh, carrying their baby on their fur that you can see in black, and other ones are carrying their baby in their mouth that you can see in light gray. And the result of that are that uh, species that carry their infant uh, in their fur tend to use much more their hand while they are eating, whereas species that carry their baby with their mouth tend to use much more their mouth to eat. So from this, uh, from this study of the behavior, we were able to see that uh, for the arboreal locomotion, for the pre-capture hypothesis, or for the infant carrying hypothesis, quite all of them tend to induce much more grasping with the end. So they are not mutual. And right now, we didn't test which one uh, uh, can precede the other one, uh, but it will be nice uh, to do it in the future. And let's move on to the second part of this talk, which is the link between the grasping behavior and the shape of the forelimb. So what we were doing here is that I will just make a brief remember of the forelimb because I'm not sure that everyone knows a lot about it. So the forelimb uh, seems to be a really good indicator of uh, locomotor behavior and other kind of behavior such as grasping ability and so on. And it is composed of three long bones that are the ulna, uh, the humerus, sorry, which is uh, the bone of the arm, and the ulna and the radius uh, that are the bone of the forearm. There is one part which is kind of important, which is the elbow joint, where a lot of movement occurred. And the, this is also a location where there is uh, the origin of a lot of muscles that are really important for the movement of flexion and extension of the finger. So it's a nice part of the forelimb. And the forelimb, or the elbow joint, include three articulations that allow for two of them one movement, so the first one allows the movement of flexion and extension of the forelimb, and this is the humeral nerve joint. The second one allows allow mainly movement of rotation, so pronation, supination, and this is the radio nerve joint, and this is mainly uh, a rotation of the radius. It's difficult to show it here that uh, turn all along the ulna and that allow this movement. And then the third articulation, which is uh, the humeroradial joint, and that allow both movements of uh, rotation and flexion extension. So what uh, we made here is that uh, we made a quantification of the shape of the forelimb. So we went in different collection uh, mainly in Paris and in Belgium, and we were uh, making a loan uh, for uh, specimens, and we were scanning uh, a lot of individuals uh, for each species. So here is just a, a subsample uh, that is totally fitting uh, what we were studying for the grasping uh, behavior part. And what we made, just a kind of sum up of the studies that we were doing. In one side, we were doing the geometric morphometrics analysis that allowed to have the, the shape of each long bone. In another side, we were doing the grasping behavior analysis that you just saw before. For both of them, we were testing if there is a phylogenetic signal. So if, for example, uh, species that are closely related tend to display the uh, same shape of the bone or the same kind of behaviors, and here the results are yes. There is a phylogenetic signal, so we need to take it into account in further analysis. And then, with both of these data sets, we were studying the covariation between the shape of each long bone and the grasping behavior. So we were doing that using methods that are called two-block partial less square and phylogenetic two-block partial less square. Okay, let's move on to the result now. Here are the results of uh, the traditional two-block partial, partial less square. And you can see in the scatter plot, in the X part, which is uh, the shape of the humerus, and in the Y are the grasping behavior. You can see that there is a coefficient of covariation, and this is, this is significant. So there is a covariation between the shape of the humerus and the grasping behavior. 
how can you interpret that? What is nice with this method is that you can go back to the shape and see how this shape is related to a behavior. So here you can see that um, in blue, you have uh, the humerus, uh, that is uh, the humerus that belong to many nocturnal species, bush babies and eye eye, and it's kind of robust. And this humerus, or this shape of the humerus, is associated to species that tend to use their mouth to grasp big and hard item, whereas they, they tend to use one hand or two hands to grasp small items. On the other side of the scatter plot, in the positive part, you can mainly see that this is journal species, it's brown lemur mainly, and they display a humerus which is much more gracile, and that tend to be associated with behavior that are grasping the food with uh, small items, uh, they grasp it with the mouth, and for the big items, they tend to grasp it uh, with one hand. Then the result taking into account the phylogeny here were not significant. So let's move on to the result for the covariation between the shape of the ulna and the grasping behavior. On the left side, you can see the result for the traditional two block partial less square, and this is not significant. But on the right side, you can see uh, the result for the phylogenetic two block partial less square, so the covariation taking into account the phylogeny. And what you can see here is that you have two species that are at the opposite side of the scatter plot. And these two species are sister taxa. And what that means here is that they have a very really different coevolution between the shape of their ulna and their grasping behavior. So it's a kind of interesting result. Concerning the result of the covariation between the shape of the radius and the grasping behavior, you can see that uh, the traditional tuba partial least square is highly significant. So concerning the interpretation, you can see that the species that are in the negative part of the scatter plot that are mainly uh, the brown lemurs, the shifakas, so all the journal species, they tend to have a radius that is really curved. And this is associated to species that tend to use uh, one hand to grasp big items, whereas they tend to use uh, the mouth to grasp the small items. And on the other side, you have all the, the nocturnal one, and they tend to have a really straight radius, which is associated to species that use the mouse to grasp big items, whereas they tend to use one hand and two hands to grasp the, the small one. So what we uh, are able to say about all these results is that the shape of the forelimb and the grasping behavior are both influenced by phylogeny, we can also see that there is a strong coevolution between the shape of the forelimb and the grasping behavior. And it seems also that uh, the uh, shape of the bone tends to constrain the grasping behavior of the species. And these results are really promising because we can infer the behavior for the extinct species because if we got the shape of uh, the extinct species, it means that we can recover their grasping behavior. So this is what we plan to do for the future. And to finish, I really want to thank again Anne, Greg, Melissa, Erin, Rachel, and all the staff of the Duke Lemur Center for organizing the symposium. I really want to thank also my previous lab and my actual lab, or my current lab, sorry. I also want to thank the collections that provide me all the material to make the geometric morphometric study, so the Museum of Natural History and the collection in Terviron. Again, the whole staff of the Duke Lemur Center where they were working for two years, and the staff of the Antwerp Zoo, the platform de morphometry uh, where I was doing all the surface scan, and finally, the Fison Foundation and the Marie Slodowska-Curie Fellowship for funding all my projects. Thank you.